as I come before you this morning, I'd like to begin by remembering a prayer that my ancestors prayed as they struggled in the land of enslavement and did not take it as an obvious that they would wake up the next morning. It was a prayer that stood over and against an empire that said that the members of that empire were the architects and the Alpha and Omega, they're sitting down and they're getting up. And this prayer stood in direct opposition and proclaimed God as the ultimate source of their lives. And my ancestors prayed, God, I want to thank you for waking me up this morning with the blood still running warm in my veins and the breath flowing throughout my body with the use of my limbs and the multiplication of my tongue. And I want to say thank you, sir. Now some of us today might be a little offended with the word sir, but you have to contextualize that because the master said that they were the sirs. But when black people prayed, it was a radical departure and a resistance to that understanding of who was sir. And so by calling God sir out loud, they were standing over and against an empire that said that they were God, empire members who said that they were God. My presence this morning comes as I stand at the door of 70, and I'm pretty close, if I don't step aside, it might hit me in the face. <laughs> it's a bittersweet moment. It is a sweet moment to thank God for bringing me this far through the turbulence of struggle, through the heartbreak of loss, and through the understanding that we're needing to walk back over roads that I thought that Jonathan, me, and my generation had cleared and fertilized for a new day coming. And now we're right back in the field, needing to plant some of the same old seeds. Amen. It is a sweet moment to remember the loving spirit of Jonathan Daniels, who in the twinkle of an eye, without any thought, protected me from Tom Coleman's bullet at his own expense. At the same time, it is a troubling moment that the hate that spewed forth from Tom Coleman's shotgun is as alive and deadly today as it was then. It is also a troubling moment that the police can still kill under the cover of the law and get away with it. Since 2007, Spirit House has been documenting what we call state-sanctioned murders, and we have documented more than 2,000 deaths of African-American men, women, and children who were killed by the police under the cover of the law. The youngest person was six years old, and the oldest person was 97 years old. And 98% of those killed by the police were unarmed. Yet they claimed that the victims had a weapon, as Tom Coleman claimed that Jonathan had a weapon. And just as it was with Jonathan, this allowed some people to dismiss Jonathan because they didn't like who he was. And therefore, if, they, if he had a knife, 
did he deserve to be killed? So we stand today in the face of criminalization, the dehumanization that goes against the new world order that Mary is calling us to in the Magnificat. Yesterday, it was a very sad moment for me. It was the same day that Julian Bond's family threw his ashes in the gulf and his friends and the buyers around the country threw flower petals in the water for his voyage to becoming an ancestor. As with Jonathan, Julian was a gentle spirit who could get fired up for freedom. As with Jonathan, Julian was a crafter of words and a builder of ideas. When I heard the news of Julian's death that came so sudden like a thief in the night, and so soon after the death of my beloved Silas Norman, who was a part of the young freedom fighters whom I knew and loved in Alabama, I wrestled with the feeling of being overwhelmed by all of this loss. Sweet Honey puts it this way, the leaves, they are a falling all around me. The leaves, they are falling, the leaves of my youth. For those of us who are still leaves on the tree, as bare as it might be, I feel that we bear a great responsibility as part of the remnant community to speak the truth with love and unbending conviction. I believe that it is our responsibility to be the memory of where God brought this country and the work that we did when this country was pregnant in building an America that was yet to, born, to be born. Memory is essential to the process of walking with God. And I believe that it is important that we tell the stories of what God did for us in the fields of Alabama. How God lifted the people up out of the bowels of Southern Apartheid. How God tenderized the hearts of people who came from the empire and made them safe. I think I'll go to Alabama, Mississippi, and Georgia. How magnificent is God's amazing grace. As I looked at the text this morning, it became horrified that I had looked at the wrong lesson. <laughs> I quickly began to ask myself a few questions to get out of this. <laughs> I, because Mary's song is part of a long prophetic tradition reflected in Isaiah when he imagines a world where people can benefit from their labor, live in houses that they build, eat of the food that they plant, and no longer die at unreasonably young ages. Mary is not out of context. She belongs to that prophetic vision. Her vision reaffirms God's call to a new world order. As I said earlier, it is the first freedom song. God promises that those who sit, sit low will be able to stand erect and tall. The Magnificat says that he has sent the powerful away. Well, I, I think that before God sends people away, that God offers many opportunities for redemption if we would choose that. 
I don't believe that this text is about a wrathful God who is so inflexible, who never changes God's mind, and who simply would confine people to an unsavory place in history without giving them a chance to change their minds. We saw that with Pharaoh. God just didn't swoop down and, and destroy Pharaoh. God gave Pharaoh how many chances? Nine chances, 10 chances to change his narrative. He could have just as well been a Pharaoh that was remembered for having liberated rather than try to hold people in, in enslavement. So I, I see this as a freedom song because it offers redemption not only for, for people who are poor, but it offers redemption for those who have lots of material things. Material things. As I think about, but you don't get there, you don't, you're not able to walk this journey without making choices, without putting our faith in action. That's what Jonathan did the night when he heard the Magnificat. It wasn't as simple as saying that, oh, I think I'll go to Alabama. He had to do some formation work. He had to put himself in process. He had to ask God to remove from his lips unclean thoughts about black people and poor people. He had to ask God to give him a new way of seeing and understanding the world. And then he had to have the faith that once God gave him the vision that he would receive it. Jonathan was in process when he went to Alabama. And when he went to Alabama, he also agreed to go where he, had, where he was once known at EDS, where he was a familiar. When he went to Alabama, he became a stranger. How many of us are willing to leave our, comfort, our comfortable environments, go to another place, and become strangers? Jonathan was willing to do that. And I think that when we celebrate Jonathan's life, a question is on the table that we must consider. The question is, what are we celebrating? Bishops, are we celebrating Jonathan's life or are we celebrating his death? I sometimes suspect that we might be celebrating his death because the West has a preoccupation with death and seems to be able to raise people up when they're dead more than they're able to celebrate them when they are alive. Amen. I wonder, what are we celebrating? I think that if we, when we think about Jonathan, it is important to think that he walked away from the king's table. And I don't mean God the king. I mean the empire king's table, where he was white, male, very bright, and possibly could have had anything that he wanted. Yet he walked away from the king's table. In order to imagine the dream, the Magnificat, that Mary prophesies, that she, the world that she prophesies, you must be willing to walk away from the king's table. Amen. Amen. I'm not saying that you have to live a ragged life with no materialism, but one must remove the lust of empire and, and excessive materialism from one's heart. As I listened to the, to the Magnificat this morning, Mary is calling for the humanization of people who've been dehumanized. 
And I have a question this morning that I think should be the preoccupation of our age. What does it mean? What theology are we fermenting and birthing in an age of a capitalist technocracy, a culture of disposability, an age of fear where only a few lives matter? What is our theology? Where is God in this world? What, what is the good news for a young man like Michael Brown, for a seven-year-old young girl like Ayanna Jones, who was shot in her bed by the police? From where I sit as an African-American woman, I believe we have a lot of work to do to bring about this new world order. It's very difficult to talk about Jonathan this morning. Last night as I watched the film, I realized how young we were. How hope flowed through our minds, our, our imaginations, our practice. How much we lived by emancipatory practice where we tried to put faith in action. And as I listened to the voices and saw the faces of Gloria, Gloria House, Jimmy Rogers, and Richard Morris Rowe, and even my own face. I wondered how did we sustain ourselves throughout the years without becoming bitter as we watched right wing people turn the clock back on the rights that some of our friends had died to gain. What do we make of this time? What is the good news? And I had a tremendous feeling of joy because it's rarely in life that we get a second chance. This is a Kairos moment for me. This is a second chance for each of us. It is an opportunity to play a critical role at a critical moment in America's history. It is an opportunity to once again to be on the front line of struggle as the country decides which direction will it go. The good news is we're not entrapped by our history, Nancy. You might be the daughter of a diplomat, but you also can become a runner for the people. Each of us has the opportunity to create a new narrative. And we're not born without choices. As white people, you have the option to choose a narrative that comes from the abolitionist movement that runs throughout social movements of the 19th and 20th centuries. That's a choice. Or you can choose a white supremacist narrative. As an African American, I have a narrative, a choice. I can choose the narrative of struggle, or I can choose the narrative of complacency. I can choose to be a runner for the people, or I can choose to be an elite. My heart is heavy this morning. I wonder what Jonathan would make of a world where intimacy has been reduced to a virtual experience. I wonder what he would make of a world where we go out to dinner and we don't talk to each other, we talk to the machine. 
movement building, the world that Jonathan imagined was a world of intimacy. It created a new intimacy, a stronger intimacy, a new union, a new marriage between people who never would have met or sat down with each other. And yet today, we live in virtual intimacy. We give over our power to social media. And what would Jonathan, who had such an incredibly analytical mind, what would he make out of a world of soundbite analysis? <laughs> What would he make of the world today? As much as Americans like to hold on to some innocence, I have to pose a hard question this morning, Eon. I have to say, I have to ask the question, what does it mean to have militarized technology in the hands of an empire who's had an unsavory history of genocide, plunder, biogenetic engineering, and other violations of God's creation and the people of God. What do we make of our future in the hands of a capitalist technocracy that has minimized the power of the federal government, we do, not in, we do not have nation states as we once did. We have corporate states where the boys with the big money make, big, make the decisions and create the decisions through a process through an organization called ELEC. And they create border, border plate legislation that they cycle throughout the nation. That's not democracy. What do we make of this world? Where do we place this within a continuity of Jonathan's struggle? I don't know about you, but I believe that we must begin to deepen our conversations about the meaning of the world that we live in today. We must begin to ask serious questions about the power of technocracy. I came up against that question when my mother was dying, and I was faced with the decision of whether or not I should pull the plug. On the surface, that seemed like a very simple decision, but theologically, it became very complicated to me because she wanted to live, and people said she was dying. She wanted to struggle, and I wanted her to struggle. And what was I doing to decide that her life should end? It was not very simple, so we we're asked to make very complicated decisions. We we're asked in many ways to usurp the role of God. And I'm not a conservative, but I think issues are much more complex than what we make them out to be sometimes. And I think that if we're going to get to the next century, we must begin to ask very hard questions about the world that we are being that we are allowed to be built, allowed, allowed to be built in our name. I am close to the riverside. I don't want to die, but I know that that's an issue that you must grapple with when you, hit, when you get to be almost 70. And I've asked myself, what is it that I would like to leave behind? How do I go quietly into the night with the radishes of racism burning the land today? Do I read the narrative of struggle with Jonathan and, and, and the rest of our friends as a time of great failure? 
Where do I find the hope to cross the riverside and believe that life will be okay? Where will each of you be standing as the pendulum of this country continues to move towards fascism? I know some people might think this is an extreme movie statement, but I think we need to think about it. We need to think about it. We need to think about what does it mean for a militarized government to declare war on its, its citizens through a war on drugs and a war on crime. Once upon a time, the federal government protected African Americans, and now it has become one of the chief part one of the chief players in a war that turns black people from citizens to criminals. What does it mean when men can buy, wealthy people can buy an election? These are hard questions and sitting in our edifices and praising God and singing great songs and shouting hallelujah and remembering the lives of our great martyrs should be sources of inspiration, not an opportunity to sit back. Where do you find your hope? When my mother sat dying at 90 years old, she sat by the front door and she looked out the door longingly and she kept asking me, Ruby, Ruby, what's gonna happen to the children? We've not prepared them to live well. And I asked the church this morning, what's gonna happen to the congregations? Have we prepared them to live and resist the world that's been created. Where is your hope? My hope lies in two simple realities. That there will always be good people like Jonathan, like Sophie Carmichael, like Father Richard Marshall, like Gloria Larry, like Jimmy Rogers, there will always be good people of all races and all social locations who will be willing to walk all the way to the cross. My other hope lies in the simple declaration that truth crushed to the ground shall rise again. That injustice does not live forever that one day it too will come to be done. And you can kill the dreamer, you can kill Jonathan, but the empire can never kill in the people a dying and undying impulse for freedom. I want to say something that I've never said before. I'm no way tired. I didn't come this far to be tired. And I didn't come this far believing that God would leave me. I believe that God has been for each of us every step of the way of our journey. And it is up to us to recognize God's presence in our lives. I'm so grateful and thankful to Jonathan for being alive this morning. I'm so thankful for love that compelled him to push me out of the way. And I'm so thankful for ordinary people in Mounds County, Alabama, who challenged my classism and let me realize that ordinary people can do extraordinary things. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.